We're going to get into the word. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Luke 10, 25 through 37. And I'll read. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the road, the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The message today is titled, Go and Make Neighbors. Let's pray. Father, your word has come to us. We've read it aloud. We've heard the wisdom of Jesus Christ. And now we have an opportunity to put it into practice in our lives. Father, help us to dive into this, to understand what you are calling us to do. Help us as hearers, Lord, to be ready, Lord, to receive as we go further in understanding what you have spoken. Father, touch the hearts and minds of everyone here Guide us, O oh God, and prepare us for your love, which you want to show to us, that we can also share with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go and make neighbors. Now, Bridge of Hope Church, we have a call. We have a mission. And what is that mission? To make mature, multiplied disciples of Jesus. We are called, just like Jesus called his disciples, and he commanded them to go and make disciples of all men, of all types of people. And as I've been on this journey of trying to put that into practice over the the past four years, I've come to realize that perhaps a first step in making a disciple is making a neighbor. See, the religious lawyer that we just read about, he asked Jesus, who is, who was my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? He was basically asking, what type of people am I supposed to love like myself? Because again, the law said, love your neighbor as yourself. And so he is saying, what type of person qualifies as someone I'm supposed to love? See, we must understand it was common in that time, it was a common teaching in Jewish culture to love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. We see that in Jesus's words in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 44. Jesus says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
So in response to this lawyer, Jesus says, or he uses a parable to explain that a neighbor is not a type of person you're looking for. So you can pick and choose how you're going to treat them. A neighbor is a relationship that you make by showing mercy. And my hope for you today is that by the end of this message, you, we all will collectively accept Jesus' command to go and do likewise. To do like the Samaritan did. In other words, as I'm putting it, go and make neighbors. So if Jesus commands us to go and do likewise, that begs the question, which actions of the Samaritan are we supposed to emulate? What are we supposed to be doing? And I've picked three here. First, what the Samaritan did was he had compassion without discrimination. Second, he treated the man's wounds. And third, he gave generously. So let's look at the first. He had compassion without discrimination. In verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. In this parable, we see a priest walk by, a Jewish man, a Jewish priest, walk by and ignore a man that is, begging, that is uh, half dead on the side of the road. Then we saw a Levite, a temple servant, walk by and ignored a Jewish man, a fellow Jew, on the side of the road. But it was a Samaritan who sees Jesus, this Jew hurting, and he is the one who had compassion. Now, this is the part of the story where Jesus would have created a shockwave through those who are listening. He tells a story about a man that is half dead, and people come on the road, and it is this Samaritan, and once it, you know, the word Samaritan comes out, and as the Samaritan had com compassion, that would have been shocking to the hearers. Why? Because the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. There was a strong hostility between Jews and Samaritans, and their hatred dated back to events even documented in the Old Testament, where there are two kingdoms. There was Judah, and then there's Israel, the rest of Israel. And Judah were, were the Jews, and Israel, their capital city was Samaria. So the Samaritans were a part of Israel, while the Jews were a part of Judah. And down the road, eventually, the Samaritans would get assimilated into other cultures. And so they intermarried with other nations. They started worshiping their other gods. And they also tried to worship the God of the Jews as well. But the Jews, they looked on at the Samaritan as unclean. Like they are not, they are idolaters. They are unclean. And we will have no part in dealing with the Samaritans. And of course, the Samaritans look at the Jews and say, you deny our heritage. You deny who we are. And therefore, they had hostility with the Jews because the Jews didn't accept them. And this hatred was deep. According to Eliot's commentary, because of these actions of the Samaritans, their idolatry, their intermarriage, the Jews looked on at the Samaritans as worse than a heathen and therefore had no dealings with them. Culturally, this Samaritan, culturally and socially, had no obligation to stop and help this Jewish man as identified in the story. As a matter of fact, perhaps a Samaritan would even think, oh, this is Jew, he's half dead. Good riddance. He's getting what he deserves. Yet, Jesus used the hostility between these two cultures to highlight that God calls people beyond the boundary lines that humans have established. He's calling us beyond our discriminatory ways. Jesus shows this example in John chapter 4 when he meets, he goes to Samaria, Samaria and he meets a woman at the well. He waits, he, and this woman also 
uh, was an outcast even within her own community. But he waits for her at the well. He asks her questions. He engages with her. He shares his life with her, and he brings light not only to her but to the entire community that was around her. Jesus had the example. He demonstrated himself how to love past discrimination, how to love past uh, the, the ideologies in our world that creates separation between two people. And so therefore, when he's, he sh gives an example of this Samaritan, he is ultimately saying, follow me and love without discrimination. Have compassion without discrimination. In order to make neighbors, you must have compassion for those who are not like you. And let's be honest about how this can be difficult at times. We often are selective about our compassion. Let me give an example. It's football season. Does everybody acknowledge that? It is football season. Some of you are excited to watch your favorite team play and possibly even win the Super Bowl. Others, if you're like me, a Panther fan, have decided to give up football completely <laughs> and take on a new hobby. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I don't like hobbies, I'll just work. <laughs> but with football teams and sports in general, we have our favorite team. Just imagine that your favorite team is in a tight game. Very close, but you're, slight, you're losing. You're losing a tight game, and then in a freak accident, the star player on the other team gets injured. I mean, that's tough, right? Injury. We should have compassion. We should feel sorry. We should feel sad. We should pray for them, right? <laughs> Isn't there like a slight delight in your heart? <laughs> I'm telling on myself. <laughs> there's, there's a slight like in, joy to know that maybe we have a chance now. <laughs> we might have a chance to win this game. <laughs> but take that same scenario imagine now it is your star player that gets injured in a tight game where you're losing you're devastated right oh no this is the end I mean you're sending out prayer hands emojis pray for this guy come on help him get up come on you're lighting up social media, talking about how awful this is. We're very selective when we do have compassion because we have teams, right? And that, that's an easy example from a sports scenario. But I want us to be honest to say that it is not just sports where we choose sides and have teams. Those teams in our culture, and obviously we see in the Jewish culture, those teams go beyond simple sports they go into our politics left versus right they go into our social status like we're hanging out with people who are like us or people there are people who are like us there are people that are not like us there's rich there's poor there's suburbs there's inner city there's race and all types of scenarios where we have a bit more compassion for people who are of our culture and a bit less compassion for people who are not. That is how the world tends to operate. But I must say, if the command of God is for us to go and do the things that I've shown you, to go and have compassion without discrimination, if that is the command of God, but that command does not penetrate through our loyalty to our team, then we need to repent. Let me put it, let me turn it on me. If I cannot look at the command of God and allow it to penetrate through my loyalty to those who are like me and allow me to go past those affiliations, then I need to repent. Our compassion should not be based on whether or not you are on the same team. We must allow ourselves to feel the hurts of those who are not like us. 
We must have compassion even for those who hate us. We must remember that Jesus loved us when we hated him. Luke 23, 34, a father forgive them for they know not what they do. Where was Jesus at this time? He is, is on the cross dying for the sins of the world. And yet his compassion looks to those who even murdered him. And ask God, ask the father to forgive them. Our compassion needs to go that deep. We need to be willing to go that deep. In Romans 5, 8, God showed his love, his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Jesus loved past our differences because we know Christ is holy. He's perfect. We are unclean. We are sinful. We are we were sinners. We did not know God, nor did we want to know God. But Christ looked past that, and he made an opportunity for us to know him. And now that we know him, we are a part of his family. But it took Christ looking past our differences. So first, just as the Samaritan, God calls us to have compassion without discrimination. The second act that we see this Samaritan do is he treated the man's wounds. Verse 34, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The Samaritan allowed his compassion to then lead to action. He made it his responsibility. I mean, it's quick and easy for us to say, not my responsibility. That's not my responsibility, not my responsibility. He actually made it his responsibility to ensure that this man was back up on his feet. Jesus has done this in his life. He has an example of this. He is an example of this. Matthew 9, 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Our God is a healer. He cares about the people and their hurts and their discomforts and their issues. He cares about their needs and their wounds. And we see over and over again in the scripture, Jesus going beyond and just healing and touch. I mean, he could have come and just taught, right? He would, he would have been rightful in his uh, way to just come and teach, but rather he came and he performed the signs to show he was God. But in the performing of the signs was miracles it was healings it was feeding us it was teaching us it was healing our hurts our mental emotional physical needs he was meeting all of those he is our example we are to follow him in second corinthians 1 3 through 5 it reads praise be to god the and father of our lord jesus christ the father of compassion and the god of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves received from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. What is it saying? As we suffer, God comforts us. He brings comfort to all of us. But as he comforts us, we are then able to comfort others. And as we comfort others, we get to point them to the God who's the God of all comfort. That is what God has called us to do. There are many stories I know in this room today about how God has comforted you. How God has, was with you through that difficulty through that trial, through those things you were praying for that you just did not see it coming for a long periods of time. But he comforted you and he kept you even in those difficulties. Why did he comfort you? He comforted you because he loved you, but he also comforted you so that you can comfort others. He heals our wounds so that we can go and help heal the wounds of others. He's the God of all comfort. 
and he uses us to share this comfort with others. Let us remember the ways that God has comforted us. Those who've experienced pain, struggle, challenges. I'll be honest, I mean, even going through this this, this time period over the past four years, there were so many ups and downs in trying to plant a campus. And I will tell you, if I would be lying if I didn't go into Apex going to plant a church with the idea that we're going to build a church. Eventually, it's going to multiply. And then the more people are going to come, and this people are going to come, and then all of a sudden we're going to have a whole congregation. <laughs> I'd be lying if I said that that wasn't in the back of my head, the hope that that would be the path. But the Lord will use everything that you experience for his glory, not your own. And if it is not his plan for you to, for those things to happen, he is going to use what he's bringing you through for something, whether you can see it clearly or not. I had to have the Lord comfort me with those words. I had to, in prayer, go to God and say, Lord, what is happening? Because I don't know why this is the way it is. Why is it not happening the way I thought it would happen? Okay, I thought I, I, thought I turned it off. <laughs> but he comforts us. When things don't go your way, he comforts us. When people persecute you, He comforts us. When your body is breaking down, he comforts us. When you have no idea why life is so hard, he comforts us. In our anxiety, in our depression, in our uh, just social economic issues, God is present and he comforts us. But he also wants us to be a part of the comforting process. He also wants us to share stories with one another about how God has comforted us. He also wants us to be in Bible study groups together or micro groups together where we share, hey, this is how God helped me. I don't know if this could help you or not, but I know that he helped me through this. We need the stories of those who are seasoned saints or those who've been around for a long time. We need to hear your stories. We need the stories of those who just came to Christ who said, I I came because of this and that. We need your stories. We need the stories of those who have backslidden and come back. We need to hear the stories of those who are going through difficulty, who's deconstructed and reconstructed and all kinds of construction. We need to hear your stories. We need to share it with one another, and we need to comfort each other. Y'all comforted me today. (laughs) I mean, bringing the fruit out, reminding us of what God has done. I mean, tell the story. That is so comforting that we see young people, we see people that, are, that have this something inside of them. It's not coming from, uh, you know, my dad told me to do it, my mom told me to do it, my pastor told me to do it. It is something, it's the Holy Spirit coming within you, calling you to go and share his gospel. That is comforting. God is working and moving in people's lives. And we sow seeds. We continue to sow. We don't know how it's going to ultimately bear fruit. But we know we are fa- that God is faithful and he will cause it to bear fruit in his own time. Comfort one another. Comfort one another. It is important that we comfort one another. And it's also important to recognize, as we see in the text In this parable that Jesus gave, there was a man who was half dead. He had a mortal injury, a mortal wound. It was going, it it seemed as if it would kill him if no one intervened. I want you to know that there is a world of people out there. And there are people, I would assume in here even, that still have this mortal wound of being apart from God. The scripture says we were dead in our sins. That was our condition before Christ came to us. We were dead in our sins. And if Christ has not come to you or if there are people in your circles out there where Christ has not been brought into their lives, they are they have a mortal wound. They are like this man on the side of the road. Just they can't do anything for themselves. Who is going to stop? 
Who is going to see them? Who is going to bring comfort to this person who has a mortal wound on the side of the road that has no way of being helped? Who is going to bring Christ to that person? Who is going to bring the comfort that you have been comforted with to that person? It's, we have to be that one. We have to, we're called to go comfort, not just physical wounds. We got to comfort the spiritual wounds of those who are dying in their sins by bringing Christ to them. Remember, who saved you from sins? Who comforted you when you were lost and out and you had no way? Who brought salvation to you? Christ, God, brought it to you. And God used someone to preach a message, to tell a story, to show love. God used someone in your life, and now it's time for you to take that to someone else. It is time. It is time. There is someone half dead that you're working with every day. There's someone half dead that you're in the line at the grocery store with. There's someone half dead uh, when we walk out, we go to the restaurant and we, uh, you know, someone orders our food or uh, they get our food for us. There's someone half dead. They're around there and they need to be identified and comforted. So what are the actions? We must comfort those who have, who need, who are hurting. Whether it's, the mortal wound of, um, of sin, whether it's physical, where they need help and we need to bandage their wounds, or whether it's a reaching out to someone who is uh, culturally different from us and we need to actually just engage and have conversation, what we have to do is we have to, be op- we have to identify the need. We have to be people who are observant and recognize what's going on in people's lives. And sometimes comforting others means praying for those who reject you. Sometimes we comfort from afar because we've offered, we've reached out, we've tried, but they've said no. They put up a block. And sometimes that means putting them on your prayer list and daily praying for them and praying for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. that The Holy Spirit will go into their lives and reach them in the ways that I can't reach them. See, this, over the summer, I began meeting with a young man, and we, we met three times. The first two times, we came to, met at a Panera, spent about an hour together talking about what our lives were and talking about the need for Christ. And he was willing to meet a second time. And after that second time, he was like, yeah, let's go. Let's study the word together. Let's, let's, let's learn. I want to be discipled. Well, I reached to him, reached out to him the third time, and he didn't respond to my texts. I show up at Panera. He wasn't there. I had a decent lunch for myself, but he wasn't there. <laughs> I tried to reach out to him later. Apparently, I had been blocked. <laughs> but I put him on my prayer list, and I'm praying for him. Sometimes you just got to be praying for people. <laughs> And that is the time at this point in time. And I don't have a re- redemption story yet at this point in time. I just know that God has called me to pray for him. And so he's on my prayer list and I'm praying for him every day. That is the call. And we have to be observant and aware of what God is bringing in our lives and how do we respond. And we respond through prayer. And I'm, he's going to be on my prayer list until God gives me the, um, the comfort of saying, all right, that's good. Move on. But right now he is on my prayer list every single day. I can't talk to him. But the Holy Spirit can move. I can't do anything, you know, I can't directly lead him right now, but the Holy Spirit can move and he can bring someone else into his life. We must comfort others. And finally, we see the third action that he took. The Samaritan, we see, was he gave generously. In verse 35, the next day he took two denarii, that's two silver coins, and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. This Samaritan had compassion. He treated this man's wounds. He comforted him and gave him what he needed. But he also paid for everything he could possibly incur from an expense standpoint. I mean, this man went above and beyond. 
Jesus gives an example of someone who goes above and beyond to meet the needs of others. I mean, don't you like when companies do that for you? Don't you like when people go above and beyond for you? I mean, you get in the airport and you find out that your flight has been overbooked. And so therefore they got to send you to another flight. That's disappointing. But then you go to the counter and they say, I'm so sorry, so sorry we've overbooked you. As a matter of fact, we're going to book you in this next flight. It's, 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 an, it's an hour later, but we're going to book you in the next flight, and we're going to change your coach seat to a first-class seat. We're going to give you a first-class, but we're also going to give you a $1,000 flight credit for this inconvenience. It was our fault. We're going to do all this for you. Talking about going above and beyond. <laughs> Just wanting to make sure you are taken care of. We want that. If someone messes up, we want them to go above and beyond. Or perhaps you check into a hotel, and you're waiting and waiting, waiting at the counter. Then you finally come up to the counter, um, and they said, we're so sorry. The computers were down. Thank you for being so patient. We're going to take your room. We're going to bump you up to the presidential suite. I hope you uh, appreciate us. We're sorry. Presidential suite. Okay, I had to wait a little bit longer. Now I get a president's suite. All right, thank you. Thank you for going above and beyond. We want people to go above and beyond for us. And I challenge you that to love your neighbor as yourself is to take that same joy and desire for people to treat you in that way, going above and beyond. Take that joy and share it and extend it to others. We need not hesitate to be generous. We need not hesitate to go above and beyond for others. We need not hesitate to love your neighbors like yourself. Jesus did this. I mean, you see, it's repetitive, right? Jesus did all these things that he ultimately is calling us to do. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Rather than maintaining his heavenly status with no interruption, he desired to let it go for a time, to give it up, to lay it down so that he can become a servant of man. Thinking about the God who created all the world would desire to come down and to serve our needs. The very one that needs nothing from us would come down and would pray, would come and he did pray for us, but he would teach us. He would heal us. He would feed us. I mean, these are servants' jobs. Who feeds us when we are going to the restaurant? The waiters and the, you know, the chefs, they're serving us. But Jesus came and took on the job, the role of a servant, to give us all that we need. The God who needs nothing comes and serves. He goes above and beyond for our needs, taking the very nature of a servant and humbling himself. This is why we are able to call ourselves Christians. This is why we are able to call ourselves children of God. This is why we're able to call ourselves a church because God became a servant. God gave up so that we may have. God died. Jesus died for our sins so that we may live. He went above and beyond. We must see that he went above and beyond anything we could want other people to do for us. He made it possible for us to have life. There was no other way. And God did it. He gave his life. He was the example. He calls us to give generously. At the end of the passage that we read, verse 36 through 37, Jesus concludes 
Luke 10, 36 to 37, Jesus concludes with, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. This is what he's telling the lawyer. He's telling the lawyer, go and have compassion without discrimination, for Jesus loved those who hated him. He's telling this lawyer, go treat the wounds of hurting people, for Jesus comforted us so that we may comfort others. He's telling him, go give generously, for Jesus gave everything so that we might have life. In doing these things, we make neighbors. In showing mercy, we obtain a new neighbor. And by following Jesus' example, by deciding to follow Jesus and do what he's called us to do, we also have eternal life. Because ultimately, that was the question that this lawyer had. What must I do to have eternal life? Well, ultimately, we must follow Jesus. We must desire, turn from our sin and follow Jesus. But in the whole context, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And one way to love, how we love our neighbor is to do what Christ did. Do what Jesus did. Love those who hate us. Comfort others so that we may be, because we were comforted, and give as give as Jesus has so generously given to us. I want to leave you with two questions. Will you accept the invitation to eternal life? A life that starts with following Jesus. And many of us have this, accepted this invitation. But if you have not, I want you to understand that this is where it begins. The, the, it doesn't begin with, eternal life doesn't begin with, All right, I'm just going to make friends. Eternal life begins with recognizing what Christ has done for you. Recognizing that God, who had need of nothing, loved us so much that he he took on the form of a servant and gave his life to reconcile, to bring people back in relationship to him and you are being called to be reconciled with God today be reconciled with the creator who loves you be reconciled with the one who knows what you need and who has a purpose and a plan for you be reconciled and become a follower of Jesus that's the first thing accept the invitation to eternal life to follow Jesus and second thing is will you accept the invitation to be a neighbor and make a neighbor Let us make disciples by taking the incremental steps of being a neighbor and making new neighbors. Let us pray. Can we stand and pray? Thank you, Jesus. Father, your word, you have said it yourself. It will accomplish what it has set out to do. It will not return void. And as your word has been spoken today, not merely just my interpretation of it, but your word in itself, we have heard it, Lord. We have been in the vicinity. We have, we have heard it, and I pray that we have taken it to heart and looked at our own lives and consider where do I stand? Where do I stand in this calling to have compassion without discrimination? Where do I stand in this calling to heal the wounds of hurting people? Where do I stand in this calling to give generously? Where do I stand in this calling to follow Jesus? Let your word do what it is called to do. Let it do what it was set out to do. And I pray that it penetrates all of our hearts, Lord, and motivates us to leave this place with a new resolve to go and heal the hurting, to go and comfort the lost. God, we need you, oh God. 
We need you, Lord. And the world needs you, Lord. The world is, is out there needing you, Lord. And we are called to be the ones who are, have this ministry of reconciliation, this ministry of bringing others to you. We thank you for what you're doing in Mateo's life, Lord, for that example. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, that you are working in him and through him. And I pray that you will continually work in and through all of us here, God. Have your way. Have your way. And I want to invite you to pray. If anyone wants to come and pray, 